This video introduces the concept of the Helmholtz energy. Alright, before you watch this video, I strongly recommend you to watch the uh, definition of the Gibbs energy video because what I'm going to do here is introduce the Helmholtz energy using exactly the same approach as what we've had, what we've had for the Gibbs energy. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, I'm just have here uh, the end of the Gibbs energy video and I'm simply going to be uh, modifying this everything that is here uh, uh, to talk about the Helmholtz energy. And we can do that because the Helmholtz energy and the Gibbs energy are very similar. They are different, uh, uh, but they share a lot of different traits. So it's actually quite useful to see uh, how uh, Helmholtz energy and Gibbs energy can be compared by simply taking what we've done for the Gibbs energy and now updating it for the Helmholtz energy. All right, let's get started. So again, the, what we're going to do here is uh, introduce not the Gibbs energy, but the Helmholtz energy. Right, so let me uh, write it down. Helmholtz energy. All right, so the uh, start of the process is the same. Uh, we have that the second law is the favorite uh, criterion for spontaneity and it's universally true. You can apply it under any set of conditions that you want. We have seen in the Gibbs energy that if you constrain yourself to constant temperature and constant pressure, then you can uh, make the second law depend only on the system, such that if you introduce a new state of the function for the system, the Gibbs energy, then you can use the Gibbs energy as opposed to the change in entropy in the universe to uh, predict the spontaneity or equilibrium properties of a process. All right, uh, but the Gibbs energy forces you to work under constant temperature and constant pressure, right? The question is, well, what happens if you don't have those conditions? All right, so uh, uh, for example, what happens if you have uh, constant temperature but constant volume, as you would have in, say, adiabatic pump calorimetry? All right, so that's what the Helmholtz energy really is going to allow you to do. Uh, let's see how. Right, that's the second uh, second law. Then we assume that the process is isothermal, there's thermal equilibrium between the systems and sur surroundings, uh, and then uh, we can come up to this uh, point right here. Now, in the Gibbs energy, what we had done was to assume that the process was isobaric, but now we change and we're going to assume that the process is not isobaric, but isochoric or isometric, which means constant volume. Okay, so uh, instead of isobaric, I'm going to use here isometric, constant volume, or isochoric as well. Now in that particular case, then the heat in the system is actually not the enthalpy. Instead, it's another state function, which is the internal energy, right? A constant volume, heat, is k sub e, but that is the same thing as the change in internal energy of the system, right? So uh, then we have this, and that means that uh, the enthalpy actually disappears, all right? And then uh, but the rest is the same, right? So notice that now what you have is that the second law, if you're working at the constant temperature and constant volume, okay, uh, you can define the second law as only depending on the system, uh, and that is just going to be the balance of the change in internal energy of the, uh, of the system minus uh, the temperature times the change in entropy in the system. Okay, so what we can do then, uh, uh, in parallel to what we did for Gibbs energy, is now introduce a new thermoinetic variable that is going to allow us to do exactly this in just one blow. All right, so there's going to be your Helmholtz energy, uh, which I'm going to define uh, as A, and different sources will use different letters for this Helmholtz energy. The one that I'm going to use is going to be A, but now the definition of A, uh, Helmholtz energy, is just going to be the internal energy minus Ts. Okay, so that is kind of the only difference between the Gibbs energy and the Helmholtz energy, is that the definition, instead of having enthalpy, has internal energy. The rest is exactly the same. Right, so now you define this as differential of u, but then you have here differential of u. And again, notice that all of this is for the system. Okay, the same thing happens for uh, the Gibbs energy system. And this that you have in this uh, square is exactly the same as the second law under isothermal and isometric conditions. Okay, so that means that you can only use uh, this, let me actually change that Gibbs energy to the Helmholtz energy. You can only use the uh, Helmholtz energy as a criterion for spontaneity or equilibrium if you're working under constant temperature and constant volume, which I'm going to write here as isometric or isochoric. 
All right, so uh, hopefully this uh, has shown you how uh, similar and different uh, uh, the Gibbs energy and the Helmholtz energy are. Gibbs energy allows you to predict spontaneity or equilibrium under conditions of constant temperature uh, and constant pressure. The Helmholtz energy allows you to do the same, predict spontaneity, but now under conditions of constant temperature and constant volume. Obviously in chemistry, in the life sciences, in most of the molecular sciences, we're going to be uh, working under constant temperature and constant pressure more frequently than under constant temperature and constant volume. Okay, so that means that the Gibbs energy will be uh, far more useful and far more prevalent than the Helmholtz energy is. But again, the Helmholtz energy will be something useful if for some reason you will need to work under uh, conditions of constant temperature and constant volume.